David Emery, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited that you're with us today on Palm Sunday. Really looking forward to what we're going to do today as we uh, look at uh, God's Word together, and I'm really looking forward to next Sunday. I love Easter Sunday. Uh, my wife and I were talking about it just the other day. She said that Easter is her favorite day of the year, even bigger than Christmas for her. And I agree, I think Easter is just fantastic. It's going to be a great day of worship. We've got Good Friday services, we've got two of those. Then two Easter services on Saturday. If you've got small children, that is a great opportunity for you to come with them. We do this kind of kids fest in between those two services. There's a petting zoo, lots of bunnies everywhere. It's, it's a lot of fun. Great photo op for the parents, that's for sure. And a lot of fun for the kids. And then three services on Easter Sunday. And hey, I just want to say, if you are at all an early riser, join us at that eight o'clock service on Easter Sunday. Uh, we would really appreciate the help there, uh, but it should be a great day. I'm really excited about it. Hey, let me pray with you, and then we're going to jump in, spend some time together in the Word. Let's pray right now. Father, we love you. We celebrate your goodness and your graciousness, and uh, we just give you glory and honor for all that you do and all that you are doing in our life. You um, grant us strength. You grant us comfort. You grant us peace. Father, we pray all three of those things for our brothers and sisters in Christ at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Nashville as they are just trying to just unpack what happened in their church last week. We pray in particular for the families of the victims, for Evelyn's family, Mike's family, Catherine's family, Cynthia's family, Haley's family, William's family. We pray for uh, the family of the shooter, and we just know that for an awful lot of people, for law enforcement who are involved, just the list would go on and on, who are trying to make sense of what happened in their presence. And so, Lord, we just pray that you walk with them, that you comfort them, that you be there for them. Um, wow. Lord, we're grateful to be able to be here today for the privilege that it is to come and be with our church family to worship you. And so we just do so with great excitement and enthusiasm. We open your word knowing that it is powerful, that it is true, and that it's transformational. So with that in mind, let's just come to this time together. Help us to do so with a lot of anticipation about how you are going to speak to us today. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful and beautiful name. Amen. Well, yesterday was what day? April 1st, what day? April Fool's Day, everybody knows that. It was also Pastor Jesus' birthday. So you all give it up for Pastor Jesus. Yeah. I would, I would kind of argue that's a tough day for a birthday, to be born on April Fool's Day. I can't imagine what he's put up with on that. I was curious about April Fool's Day, why we do this, why it's the day where you pull pranks on each other. Uh, it actually goes all the way back to ancient Rome. It has that kind of heritage. So people have been pulling a fast one on people for a really long time on April Fool's Day. Did any of you all prank like your brother, your sister, your you know, husband, your wife, anybody? Just shoot your hand up. A couple of people, not a lot of you. A lot of you let it go by. There you go. A few of you did. Uh, Sherry Wester, who is, uh, kind of plays a key role in organizing a lot of our connectors and greeters and so forth, I called her yesterday to work on a detail, and she told me, I, said, I asked her, I said, hey, how you doing? What you doing this morning? She said, I'm looking out my window at two of my grandkids who are toilet papering my car. And... Uh, she said, they think they're getting away with something, and I'm having as much fun watching them do it, you know, as anything else. So that's what, uh, what happened with her uh, yesterday. She just let them go. That is A-class grandmothering 101 right there, to let your kids TP your car. Um, there was an epic April Fool's Day prank pulled back in 1957 by BBC, no doubt the most straight-laced media organization on the planet, right? 
they pulled a huge prank on the entire nation of Britain. They ran a documentary about how in Switzerland they were experiencing a bumper spaghetti crop, that the spaghetti farmers had never seen anything like it. Here's a screen grab from the documentary. They had a, a well-respected journalist do the voiceover, so they've got you know this beautiful British voice talking about the spaghetti harvests. And people fell for it by the hundreds. People called BBC asking where they could get spaghetti trees to plant in their own yard. And the best call of all was one guy not making this up. This was documented. One guy called and said, do I need to plant my spaghetti tree in spaghetti sauce? Which I thought, I thought that was absolutely brilliant, right? Have you, have you ever misunderstood something before? Maybe it was an April Fool's prank, maybe something else, but you know, sometimes when you fall victim to a misunderstanding, it's harmless, right? You think there really are spaghetti trees and you fall for it. And you just you feel a little embarrassed, a little sheepish because, yeah, you were that, that guy, that girl. But we also know that sometimes when you fall for a misunderstanding or when you experience a misunderstanding, it can be really serious. Sometimes the consequences are really high, right? Uh, it might be that you're in kind of a serious conversation with your spouse and there's a misunderstanding. It, nothing was you know, implied or meant that was harmful in what you said or did, but it was not received properly. Ever had that happen to you if you're married? And uh, man, that can be a toughie, right? That can really mess you up. If you're at work and you're turning in a project and there was a misunderstanding about the project, hmm. That can be really tough, can it? I mean, it can, it can blow up your whole job situation. It can be really, really serious and have just huge consequences. What about in your spiritual life? I mean, we're, we're here in church today because we are pursuing Jesus Christ, right? We want to understand him. We want to know him. But if you have a misunderstanding about who Jesus is, it can have a profound impact on you, can it not? And if you're... In that situation, if you don't really understand who Jesus is, you are not alone. <laughs> There's plenty of people in our culture today who don't really understand who Jesus is. And in fact, we're not the first generation to have that problem. You go all the way back to Jesus' day, and there were people who didn't understand who Jesus was during his own lifetime. And today we're looking at the story of the triumphant entry. And as we look at this story the story of the triumphant entry, it's actually a story of misunderstanding. And when we think about the story of the triumphant entry, we automatically think about palm branches and people waving and everybody's happy that Jesus is there. And that's how we see that event. And we don't recognize that in this moment, as Jesus was being welcomed into the city, that it was actually a huge misunderstanding about who Jesus really was truly was, right? And so we're going to kind of dig into this piece of scripture. We're going to dig into this story. You all, we're going to spend do, with a lot of verses today. Some day, days we get together, we look at the word and, and we only cover just a handful of verses. Other days we get together and we cover a lot of verses. Today is one of those days where we're going to be looking at a lot of verses in in the Bible. So I want you to open your Bibles to John chapter 12. Uh, if you've got a print Bible with you, that's fantastic. <clears throat> Pardon me. If you don't have a print Bible with you, you can follow along in your device. If you don't have a Bible app on your device, quickly download our church app, and you can. There's a Bible feature on it. You can use that to help you uh, find John chapter 12. So while you're looking for John chapter 12, let me just give you the background of what's going on. It ties into what we looked at last week. Um, Jesus has raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, and you can imagine. If, if you raised someone from the dead, your fame would just skyrocket, right? And that's exactly what happens for Jesus. Be, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, uh, everybody knows about it. Everybody um, finds out about it. And the religious leaders of the day, when this occurs, the religious leaders of the day put out an arrest warrant for Jesus. They want to take his life. They want to kill him. Uh, they don't want him to continue to have the fame and so that he's having. So it's very dangerous for Jesus right now to move around. In particular, it's dangerous for Jesus to go to the city of Jerusalem. And so he avoids this for quite some time. But the Bible tells us that six days before Passover, 
Six days before Passover, Jesus makes his way to Bethany. Bethany is kind of a suburb, if you will, of the city of Jerusalem, so it's very nearby. And Lazarus, this is where Lazarus was from. This is where Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus' sister Mary anoints Jesus with a pound of expensive perfume. This is what we looked at last week. It's a beautiful act of worship. And then the next day, okay, so he comes to Bethany six days before Passover. How many days before Passover? Six days. Then the next day, five days before Passover. How many days before Passover? Five days before Passover, Jesus arrives in the city of Jerusalem. How many days before Passover? Five days before Passover. It's going to be important later, okay? Let's look at the story. John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had uh, done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd, which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. So all of this is happening at the festival or at the celebration of the Passover. The Passover festival commemorated God's deliverance of the people of Israel out of the nation of Egypt where they were in slavery, where they had been in slavery for four hundred years. And after repeated efforts to convince Pharaoh to free the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, after this goes on over and over and over again, God strikes down the firstborn in the nation of Egypt. And for the people of Israel, they were warned about this and they were instructed to take the blood of the lamb to paint that over their doorpost and everyone, every family who was covered by the blood of the lamb would be spared. They would be saved. Okay. So by the power of God, the entire nation of Israel is set free from slavery and bondage in the nation of Egypt. And as you can imagine, an event of that scale, that many people being set free from bondage, can you not imagine that turns into a national holiday? <laughs> of course it does. And that's exactly what happens in the nation of of Israel. So Passover, the Passover celebration always began on the 15th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. Okay, always on the 15th day of that month. Month The, the month of Nisan most closely parallels with our calendar month, the month of April. And the Passover festival was intended to be this time of spiritual renewal. So just thousands upon thousands of Jews would make this pilgrimage to the city of Jerusalem so they could be there at the temple to celebrate this historic event with all of the nation of Israel gathered around them. And at Passover, each Jewish family would sacrifice a lamb, and then they would eat the meat from that sacrifice as a part of a traditional meal, okay? So this is a time of tremendous fellowship, and, and this meant, in order for everybody to have lamb, this meant that thousands of lambs would be brought into the temple area there in Jerusalem so people could buy them and make their sacrifice and then celebrate the holiday, okay? Okay? Now, according to Jewish tradition, the lambs for the Passover were always selected on the 10th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. That is five days before the Passover, okay? You got it? So five days before the Passover began, the lambs would be inspected to make sure that they were suitable for sacrifice, and then they would be set apart for the Passover meal. So... John chapter 12, verse 1 says that Jesus was anointed in Bethany six days before the Passover. How many days? Six days before. Then John 12, 12 says that the next day Jesus went to Jerusalem. So he arrived in Jerusalem how many days before the Passover? Five days before the Passover. So Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on the same day that the lambs were selected for sacrifice for Passover, okay? Do you see something happening here, something at work here? 
So on selection day, Five days before Passover, the sheep would all enter into the city of Jerusalem near the temple through a gate in the city walls, and the name of the gate that they would go through was very creatively named the Sheep Gate. Okay, doesn't that make sense? That's exactly what it should be called, right? So all of these sheep, thousands of sheep, are pouring into the city of Jerusalem to be selected for sacrifice five days before the Passover, and they're all pouring in, streaming in through the sheep gates, okay, near the temple area in Jerusalem. And it's widely believed, based on Jesus' travel and so forth from the city of Bethany, that Jesus would have entered the city of Jerusalem through which gate? Through the sheep gate. So, five days before Passover, on the very day that the sacrificial lambs were selected, Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem through the Sheep Gate. And what is being communicated here? What is being communicated is that Jesus is indeed the Lamb of God come to take away the sins of the world and that he would be the ultimate sacrifice. Now, news of Jesus' miracles, in particular the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, in nearby Bethany, news of Jesus' miracles has spread. Everybody has begun to hear about Jesus. Everybody wants to see Jesus. Everybody wants to just get a peek at this man. And so his popularity is as high as it can possibly be. And so as he comes into the city, there are people who, who are hoping that Jesus will be the king who will lead the nation of Israel against uh, the Romans. And so when Jesus arrives, it's a really big deal because there's all this misunderstanding about who Jesus really is. And so when people see Jesus coming through the sheep gate, they react like a king, like a conqueror is coming into the city. And they start waving palm branches at Jesus, which was the traditional way to welcome a hero. The closest thing that I can think of in our own cultural experience would be a ticker tape parade in New York City, right? So imagine, if you would, a ticker tape parade, right? So Jesus comes in, and there's this huge celebration. Everybody is, is welcoming him as a king. And look at what they're shouting. They're shouting, Hosanna, 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 which means save us now, save us now, save us now. And they are also shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. So you, get a, you begin to see an idea of what everybody who was there, what all these people who were, who were at this moment, what they were expecting, what they were hoping to experience. Do you get it? They were all looking for a king. And as the people are shouting, Jesus finds a young donkey to ride into town. And when you put all of this together, it's a direct fulfillment of, uh, of a prophetic uh, prophecy in the, in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Look at it. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the people want Jesus to be a king who saves them from the Romans. But Jesus enters the city humbly through the sheep gate on the day that the sacrificial lambs are selected. Do you see the contrast between what the people wanted and what Jesus is telling them in so many ways? This is the kind of Savior that I am. Do you see the contrast? He's not at all the king that people were expecting, but was he, was he the king that people needed? Absolutely. He was the king that people needed. And so when the Jewish leaders see all that's going on, they see the welcome, they see the way people are reacting to Jesus, they are not happy at all. Okay? Look at what they say in, in John chapter 12, verse 19. Then the Pharisees said to one another, You see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. I want you to think about that last statement there for just a moment. The whole world has gone after them. And you might look at that and you might say, well, that's just because this huge crowd of people was pursuing Jesus. They were all there greeting Jesus. And that was a part of it, but it wasn't all of it. If you look at the very next verse, verse 20. Now some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the festival. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested of him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Now, what is going on here? Well, in Jesus' day, there were a number of Greeks. 
and who were kind of dissatisfied with their own religious experience, okay? If you know anything at all, if you remember when you studied in school a Greek religion, you know, Zeus and Apollo and all these, you know, this pantheon of Greek gods. And so there were Greek people who were experiencing that as the religious form, and they were finding it lacking. And they were looking for truth. And so they're like, well, let's go. It's very different than, than our Greek experience. Let's go to Jerusalem. Let's go to the Passover because the Jews worship one God. And they don't have any idols. They don't do any of this kind of stuff. And this God is not like the Greek gods. This God is righteous. This God is holy. So let's go and let's check out the one true God and see if those claims are true. So they come to celebrate the Passover and just experience what it's like. And while they are there, to experience the Passover, who do they encounter? They encounter Jesus. And they begin to talk to the people who are welcoming Jesus into the city and they hear about what he's done. They hear that he's raised Lazarus from the dead. And what do the Greeks say? They say, hey, we're here looking for truth. We want to meet Jesus. That's who we want to meet. And so the Jewish leaders see this. They take all of this in. And they say, look, even the Greeks who are coming here to experience the one true God, even they are drawn to Jesus. The whole world is going after Jesus. The whole world. And as Jesus understands that the Greeks are coming to him, he recognizes that the gospel now has the capacity to truly spread all over the world. This is a different day. This is a different era. This whole business of following Jesus isn't just confined to Galilee or, or, or a few followers also in Jerusalem. This is now for everyone. And Jesus sees what's going on and listen to what Jesus says in response in verse 23. Jesus replied to them when he learns about the Greeks. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. The one who loves his life will lose it. The one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So Jesus says, okay, this, this is the right moment for me to fulfill my mission. The time has come. The time has come. And then he goes on and he says, I'm going to be like a seed that is planted. And when you plant a seed, what happens? That seed dies, but what happens? It bears great fruit, right? And Jesus says, this is it. His whole life has been set aside in obedience to the Father, and now it's time for him to fulfill his mission. And then he throws out a challenge for you and me and for anyone through any generation who says they want to follow Jesus. He says, listen, this is the time to walk in obedience. You take up my example and you follow him. And as he hears the crowds chanting and sees them waving palm branches, the contrast of everything, it just hits him. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Imagine for a moment that you're Jesus, right? And you come into the city through the sheep gate. You know what is in front of you, right? And people are chanting and they're welcoming you like a king. And you realize in hours, in just hours, I'm going to be crucified. Can you imagine the contrast and how that contrast, what that would mean for you emotionally, right? So look at the next words of Jesus in verse 27. He says, now my soul is troubled. I would imagine so, right? Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So as Jesus considers everything that's going on, as he knows about the reality of his own death and he sees the way that people are responding all around him, he is troubled by it. And this internal debate pops up, right? Do you see what's going on there? And in this internal debate, he says, man, should I pray that I just get out of this? <laughs> should I just pray that, that we just avoid the cross and we just stay here in this moment where I'm being celebrated? Is that, would that be the right thing to do? And then he stops and says, no, that wouldn't be the right thing to do at all. 
God, I want you to be glorified. I'm here to glorify your name. Uh, that's an incredible place to arrive, isn't it, in this moment? And when Jesus arrives in this moment, God responds to him. Look at verse 28. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said, was that thunder? <laughs> There's, an angel has spoken to him. So when Jesus comes to this determination that he's going to face the cross, God speaks in an audible voice and affirms him. And he says, Jesus, I have been glorified throughout your ministry. I have been glorified throughout your life. And I will continue to be glorified as you proceed to the cross in obedience so that everyone may be redeemed. I've been glorified this whole time. I'll be glorified again. And people hear this voice of God when they don't understand. Hey, let me just ask you, have you ever been talking to somebody and they're kind of opposed to the idea of Christianity? They're opposed to the gospel. They're opposed to the idea of Jesus. And maybe they say something like this. They say, well, if God speaks to me in an audible voice, then I'll believe. You ever had somebody like that? I had a next door neighbor as a kid growing up and she was older than I was. And, and I was just a little kid. I was raised in church. I was raised knowing about Jesus. She was not raised in the church and she was very against the gospel. Okay. And so she was, in, you know, in junior and high school or so. I was in middle school, and we would sit and have debates and about whether or not Jesus was real. And my perspective was, well, of course Jesus is real. Anybody can see that. And she was like, only a fool would believe in Jesus. And so we'd have these conversations. And I remember her one time saying that very thing to me. She said, "Well, if God speaks to me right now in an audible voice, I'll believe it." And I was like, "Come on, God, lay it on her, right? You know, okay, just." Hit her right between the eyes, right? Yeah, let her, let her have it. Let her have it, you know? This is exactly what happens here. God speaks in an audible voice, and people still don't get it, right? People still don't get it. Look at John 12, 30. Jesus responded, this voice came not for me, but for you. In other words, he's saying, hey, if you needed an audible voice, you just got it. And you still don't understand who I am, okay? So Jesus kind of changes the subject of this moment. He starts talking about what will be accomplished through his death, through his crucifixion, okay? Look at verse 31. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And then verse 33, he said this to indicate what kind of death he was about to die. Now, I want you just to look at verse 33 there for a moment, okay? Verse 33 there is an explanation for people like you and me who didn't live in Jesus' day in the city of Jerusalem who would not know that the expression lifted up meant to crucify somebody. Okay, so the expression lifted up when Jesus uses that term, everybody who heard him speaking would have known exactly what he meant because it was a common expression that described crucifixion. So verse 33, there is a note for you and me saying, hey, heads up. This is what Jesus meant. Okay, so Jesus says, hey, listen, I'm about to be crucified. And the reason is that. The, the judgment of this world is about to be poured out on me. I'm about to pay the penalty for the sins of humanity. And when this happens, Satan, the ruler of this world, he is going to be defeated. How is this going to happen? How is God going to be glorified? How is Satan going to be defeated? How will sin be overcome? How will death be judged? It's all going to happen on the cross. It's all going to happen when Jesus is lifted up. Okay? And so everybody who hears him knows that Jesus is saying, you all, you might be cheering me today. You might be welcoming me as a king today. But I'm looking at crucifixion. I know where this goes. And everybody who hears him is, is blown away. Because remember, they're welcoming him as a king who will overthrow the Romans, right? Who will get rid of the Romans. And Jesus says, that's not what's going to go down here. I'm going to be crucified by the Romans. And so people have a really hard time with this. And, and so in verse 34, the crowd replied to him, we have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? How can you say he is going to be crucified? Who, who is the Son of Man? 
Who are you? And because they're still thinking of Jesus as a political savior, so they don't get it. How can, how can a political savior, how can Jesus be crucified? It just doesn't make sense to them at all. And so Jesus is looking at this huge crowd of people, and he knows this is not the time to get into a religious debate, right? He knows that it's not. So instead, he just kind of gives them a warning. Look at verse 35. Jesus answered, The light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that darkness doesn't overtake you. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of light. Jesus said this, and look at this next little statement. Then went away and hid from them. Okay? So Jesus says to them, hey, you can debate this all you want, but you can't just turn me into a savior of your liking. Okay? I came preaching a gospel, and you need to respond to that gospel. And your days with the light, he's referring to himself, and your days with the light, those days are numbered. You're only going to have this window of opportunity just a little bit longer. If you don't, you're going to run out of daylight. I love the summertime. <clears throat> I love, uh, you know, uh, daylight savings time. I love the fact that I can mow the grass at 9 o'clock at night. I love that. I just, I just love all of that, you know. love having just a little more daylight, right? And Jesus says to them, hey, listen, daylight is running out. Your chance to actually see me and believe in me like this, these days are numbered. And at this point, Jesus goes into hiding. And if you keep reading the book of John, Everything from 12 on, you know, the next several chapters of teaching that Jesus does, it's all with his disciples. It's not out in public. It's just his closest group of people. And the next time that we see Jesus publicly is when he's betrayed by Judas and arrested. Okay, So Jesus' ministry fundamentally changes at this point. Now, let me just kind of pull this together for us, okay? Last week, we began our preparations for Easter, and we just focused on the worship of Jesus. We looked at that anointing story, the story of the anointing in Bethany. It's this beautiful, beautiful story of worship. And today, we're continuing our preparations for Easter. Next week, Easter Sunday, we're going to worship huge because of the risen Savior. And so today, as we kind of continue that preparation, we're just digging in on who Jesus really is. You see, it, it, it's impossible to worship Jesus if you don't know the truth about who he is, right? Because in Easter, when it comes to this, so many people, when we come to Easter, are kind of in the same place that the people were when they welcomed Jesus to the city, right? And so they'll, they'll come at Easter and on Easter Sunday, and they, they will, we'll cheer and we'll shout, we'll be excited, it'll be great. But we can do that without really understanding you know, who Jesus is. And just as, as people back in Jesus' day had a misunderstanding about whether or not Jesus was who they thought he was. They thought Jesus was a political king, right, who was going to free them from the, the tyranny of the Roman Empire. That's what they thought, but that's not at all who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And I fast forward that to, to today, and I ask myself, well, what are the misconceptions that people have about Jesus today? What are they, Right? And as I, as I read in social media and pay attention to, to, to you know, what I'm reading and talking to different people, some people, it occurred to me, really see Jesus as a, as a social justice warrior, right? And so they, they look at the teachings of Jesus and they see how he elevated women and how he, he obliterated the idea of race. And, and they see all of this and they kind of latch on to those ideas and they say, see, this is who Jesus is. He's all about social justice. And for them, that is the sum and total of who Jesus is. And it's true that Jesus elevated people of every nation and tribe and gender. And that's all true. But that's not all that Jesus is, is it? And other people look at Jesus and they see what Jesus taught. And they say, well, Jesus is the, is the ultimate illustration of holiness. And he calls us to be holy people. He calls us to be righteous people. And for them, it's, it's kind of almost this legalistic concept that, that to be a Christian is, is to just be about being holy. That's what it's all about. And that's what Jesus is all about. And it is true that Jesus is holy. 
absolutely true. And it's also true that Jesus calls us to holiness. Absolutely true. But is that all that Jesus calls us to? Is that it? Is Jesus either social justice guy or is he holiness guy? And Jesus, when he walked into that misconception there on the streets of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Jesus says, I'm the guy that's been sent by God to fulfill a mission. To fulfill a mission. And that mission is to right a horrific wrong. And that wrong is the fact that all of humanity, including you and me, currently live beneath the heavy penalty of sin. And all of us have willingly made and acted on decisions that run contrary to God's perfect will for you and for me. I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. We've all fallen short of glory, God's glory. Every single one of us. And as a result, every single one of us deserves to be cast out of God's presence in effect in the wilderness. Uh, several months ago, Pam and I were celebrating a, a wedding anniversary. We took a, a wonderful vacation out to the desert in the southwest. And we got to drive from one place to another, driving through those deserts. It was really kind of neat to see. But I'm driving down uh, along the interstate highway, right, in this wonderful car. And I've got my phone plugged into the little system, so I'm using, you know, my, my Apple CarPlay. And uh, I've got my GPS turned on. And my voice on my, on my smartphone is an Australian guy that I've named Nigel, okay? <laughs> And I love me some Nigel, man. He is so helpful. And so I've got Nigel over there in his Australian accent telling me, you know, turn left now, you know, kind of thing. It's always calm. Even if you blow it, he very sweetly says, you were wrong. You know, turn around, go back the other way. He's so nice about it. <clears throat> so I've got this wonderful GPS that gives me a map that helps me see exactly where I am. I want you to imagine, though, being in that same desert no highways, no roads of any kind, no map, no GPS, no Nigel lovingly telling you where to go. That's what it means to be lost. And because of our sinfulness, we are cut off from God. It's like we're wandering in the wilderness and we're lost. And if God had not acted, if God had not taken the step, we would remain in our lostness. And Jesus has come on the mission to find us, to rescue us, to invite us to follow him. And he invites us to set aside our preconceived ideas about who he is and instead accept who he really is. And who is he? He is our savior. He is our king. He is the son of God, second member of the Trinity. And this king humbled himself and he paid the penalty of our sin, the ultimate lamb of God, so that we, you and I could be rescued from our wandering. And to be rescued by Jesus, we have to surrender ourselves to him. We have to say, you know where to go, I don't. I will follow you, right? I'm lost. I want to be found. I want my, my wandering to be over. Jesus, will you rescue me? And that decision that you make to invite Jesus to rescue you opens the door to eternity for you. And to make that possible, well, that's the reason that Jesus died. That's the reason he paid the penalty for your sin and for my sin so that he might bring us back to God. And so today, as you prepare for Easter, just a week away, make sure that you're ready to worship, right? But make sure you're ready to worship who Jesus really is. He is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. And today, it may be that you've embraced that and you've accepted Jesus. Man, spend this week preparing your heart celebrate the fact that you are saved, that you are found, you are no longer lost. 
And if you're here today and you haven't yet accepted Jesus, oh my goodness, how important is this day? Because there's no way that Easter will have any real meaning for you if you don't say, Lord, I want to be found. I recognize who you really are. I recognize you are the Lamb of God. Come to take away my sin. Jesus, do so. I want to give myself completely to you. So we're going to pray right now. And for those of you who have accepted Jesus, fantastic, wonderful news. Just thank God for what he's done in your life. Thank Jesus for what he's done. Tell him how much you're excited about next week's celebration. And for those of you who haven't yet accepted Jesus, let me tell you, today is the day to take that step. Let's bow our heads right now and let's pray together. Father, we just come before you today. We love you. We love you because you first loved us. And you've demonstrated your love so clearly, so beautifully, so boldly by giving us Jesus. Jesus came, gave up the splendor and the glory of heaven, and he humbled himself. And he came and he walked this earth just like one of us. And he was obedient to you, even to being obedient to the point of dying on a cross so that he could pay the penalty for our sin. He is the Lamb of the world. He is the one who comes to take away our sin. And so, Father, we just celebrate that truth right now. And for those in this room today who've accepted Jesus, we just I just pray that right now you hear our celebration of your goodness. But Lord, there are some people in this room right now who have yet to accept what you have accomplished for them through Jesus. And I pray that today is the day that they say, Jesus, I'm tired of wandering in the wilderness lost. I want to be found. Will you save me? And God, I know that you hear their prayer and that today they can leave here differently than when they came in. We pray this in the great name of Jesus Christ. And everyone agreed and said, Amen.